So I love your story. I know that you won a Super Bowl previously with Kansas City. You've bounced around the NFL. In October, you landed back in Kansas City. You played sparingly, you know, practice squad, on the roster, and active things like that. And I saw a tweet a little bit before the Super Bowl from Adam Schefter that you were activated off the practice squad when Joe Tooney couldn't give it a go. So kind of take us behind the scenes how you found out that you were going to be active and playing in Super Bowl 58. Um, you know, during the entire playoffs, I was, you know, up and down during and having communication with the coaching staff. So um, the game plan was always for me to play during the playoffs. Um, unfortunately, you know, Derek Nobby went down in the first playoff game. But um, with the confidence of Spags and uh, the coaching staff, you know, kind of it was next man up mentality and uh, making the most of the opportunity. So you definitely made the most of your opportunity. We all know the way that people have been talking about you since the Super Bowl on Sunday. How do you kind of look back at your performance in the big game? Um, I mean, to be honest with you, I haven't watched the film. Um, I've been seeing a lot of clips out there and everything like that, but I kind of let the coaches tell me what's good and what's bad about the game. And uh, everybody said I had a pretty good game, but um, I still haven't watched the game. I'm still in the mode of, um, you know, I'm, I'm up in the clouds right now about being winning the second ring, you know. And with the guys that we did it with, you know, it was it, it really was historic. So um, I'm just enjoying that right now. Well, one of my favorite plays was in the third quarter, and I didn't realize it in the moment. You know, I was at the stadium, and you kind of get caught up in the game, and then you go back and you watch things and you see things. But there's a viral clip now in the third quarter. We all know how great Trent Williams is. You put him on his ass, and then you tackle Christian McCaffrey. That was some play that you made. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, that's that's the clip I've been seeing going around. And um, just the run defense, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people are seeing me, but Mike Dana crushed George Kittle on that play, man. It was it, it was physical play all day, and um, I was just glad to be able to make the play. But, uh, yeah, that, that, that was a good play. That was a good one. Uh, another good play, and it was an underrated part in this game, just because so much happens, you kind of forget what happens earlier in the game was the uh, forced fumble on Christian McCaffrey, which was a big turnover. When you look back how close the game was, uh, kind of take us through how that ball got uh, punched out, and then we all know uh, that George ended up making a, a great play to recover it. Yeah, I mean, uh, shout out to Spags. Um, we work this stuff all the time, you know, uh, Kansas City and Coach Reed, Spags. I mean, they're real true professionals. So all these scenarios, we work through all of them in practice. Uh, Spags had each one of the D linemen scooping up and grabbing fumbles, and we're doing that every week. So um, it's really just being prepared for the moment, and uh, we always are. Talking to Mike Pinnell right now, one of the unsung heroes of Super Bowl 58. We had your defensive coordinator, Steve Spagnolo on the other day. We all know that you guys in the locker room love him. I even see the smile on, on your face when I mentioned Spags, and I'm sure you have your in Spags We uh, Trust uh, t-shirt. Just what makes Steve such a special uh, defensive-minded uh, coach for you guys uh, in that Chiefs locker room? Um, I just think it's just how multifaceted he is. I mean, everybody doesn't know, you know, Spags is really a DB coach at heart, and he really knows how to develop guys, and his defense is so complex and versatile that, you know, it's a lot of times built on trust within the coach and the players next to you. We have a lot of adjustments, and um, just being able to be a part of that and the greatness is what Coach Spags is. I mean, you look at what he's done as a defensive coordinator. I mean, I don't, I, I don't see anybody comparable. Maybe I'm biased, but I don't. And here's the crazy part. You guys just won a Super Bowl. And I, I texted Spags in week three, and I said, man, you guys got a good defense this year. I know you joined the team later on in the season towards the end of October, but I don't think this defense still has got enough credit for what you guys have been able to do. Do you still kind of sense that a little bit? Um, it's still always the underdog mentality with us. I mean, now that the playoffs are over, I can speak on it. I mean, just a lot of the defenses we were playing with Baltimore and you know, even with San Fran, we're, we're speaking on us, we're speaking for us. I'm thinking they're going to talk about the the offense, but they're talking about our defense, how they're more physical and they're this and do that. And, you know, we, we talk with our pads. If you put on the tape, our DBs are coming down here, our linebackers, uh, our defensive linemen are pursuing and tackling running backs. So we, all of us as a whole defense, take that personally. And I think um, us finishing that too, that, 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 that left a little stain on our heart. So everybody knows that there's still more to go and, you know, you guys are going to get higher up. Mike Pinnell here with us. Um, I got to get you to the whole overtime thing. It's wild when you look back okay. at it and you see how your sideline had structure. You knew what you guys were doing. The other sideline had no clue. How did you kind of process it when you were watching it? And then, boom, uh, they, they win the toss, the Niners, and then they elect to take the ball. 
I mean, like like I said, we're prepared for all situations. I mean, I, we were surprised. Um, and once again, our defense and how we're set up, we took that as, you know, a challenge and everybody was excited. And the magnitude of that game, uh, I don't think it was was hard for everybody not to exhaust themselves in that moment. So we were prepared. Our, our coaching staff prepared us for it. But, you know, like, you know, people were commenting about the fire alarms and the holding and the this. I mean, there's just a lot of talking and excuses, man. Uh, at some point, you got to put the film on. And at some point, the game is over with, and, you know, just try again next year. Yeah, the excuses after this game. I see a lot about the the holding on, on social media. It's ridiculous. Like, the Niners had every chance to win that game. They could have put you guys away, and they kept on letting you guys hang around, hang around, and you knew eventually Mahomes uh, was going to get going, and you guys were going to find the way to win that game. Um, Absolutely. I mean, and it's, I guess it's a new trend now in the NFL. Maybe I'm just too old of a veteran, but – Everybody talking so much before the game. I thought that was more of a basketball thing, but now it's creeped its way into football. So I guess that's just what we're dealing with with this new age and this new social media. But um, I, I just like that how our guys respond uh, to all the criticisms in the media and even being underdogs the entire playoffs. I mean, we know what we're capable of as defense. And, I mean, everybody should know who Patrick Mahomes is in those moments. And if you give him a chance, we're gonna, we're, we're, we're pretty confident if we give that guy a chance. So, so you felt like you were disrespected and this team was disrespected throughout this run? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, I can't speak for anybody, but uh, in the locker room, I know the defense really took it personally how, you know, how they were spoke so highly of the Ravens, you know, rushing, rushing offense, their offensive line. And if you look at the game in the NFL during the playoffs, it's won and lost in the trenches. If you look at the games that we played Buffalo, Miami, um, Ravens, and San Fran, these are top running teams in the NFL. So, where the comments came about physicality and how we couldn't stop the run. I mean, there were some leaky yardage in the QB runs. Yes, you know, Buffalo game and even in the Baltimore game, but that's Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson. I mean, come on, they're both elite at what they do. So um, we definitely took that personally, and I feel like you put it on the tape, man. Uh, we we put up. We put it up. Now, there's no doubt about that. Talking to Mike Pinnell, now a two-time Super Bowl champion. When you hear me refer to you as a two-time Super Bowl champion <laughs> – and your journey uh, is something really special. Right. You know, I know you you had cancer when you were two years old. You had a few <laughs> stops in college, and you've been a journeyman in the in the NFL. But knowing everything that you've gone through in life to get to this point, what does it mean to you to now hear you referred to as a two time Super Bowl champ? Um, I mean, to be honest, everything. Like you said, my story was never on the straight road. It had a lot of bumps and potholes, but you know, um, the team I've had around me, my family, they've always instilled confidence in me and. You know, always told me, you know, I can do what I put my mind to. And just being in this position and being able to be a part of NFL history is just nothing short of a blessing. You know, you got to give all glory to the man upstairs and be able to put me in this position and being able to put in the work and be able to see your dreams and play with confetti with your children at the game. I mean, that's I mean, this is movie stuff that I'm living right now. Now, when people call you an unsung hero, it means that they're not really familiar with you and they weren't expecting you to be this dominant of a force in the Super Bowl. So it's a nice compliment, but it's marinated in a surprise factor. Now, obviously, you know your story better than anybody. What do you want people to know about Mike Pinnell? I mean, it just adds a tip on my shoulder. I I'm glad nobody's talking about it. I'm glad everybody thinks, you know, it's a one-off. But I've been in the NFL 10 years, and the guys in the Kansas City Chiefs building and, you know, the guys around the league – who I've been around, you know, as you know, it's hard to be in the league 10 years. So, you know, there, there, there's something that's going on here that uh, I kind of know what I'm doing. So uh, keep giving the doubt. I love the unsung hero, but the Kansas City Chiefs fans, they know who I am. And um, I feel like now um, being a two-time Super Bowl champion, we got a little bit of league respect. Well, Chiefs fans also know who Chris Jones is. Uh, you being a teammate of, of his, and this dude just keeps on elevating his game. And, and we all know he's a great player, but he shows up in the big moments. And that was evident in the Super Bowl to get you guys the ball back. And then Mahomes put the game away to McCole Hardman. What stands out to you the most since you're a teammate and you've known Chris throughout the years? Um, you know, for me, what, what stands out most about Chris that, you know, the outside world doesn't um, understand is how literally hardworking he is. That man is literally a legendary player that works at a level that, you know, that people don't comprehend. He's very motivated by, you know, the greats at what he does. He wants to be a great at what he does, and he applies it every day. So being around that guy is infectious. You know, the way he prepares, you know, the way he plays the game, you know, he, it's easy to rally around that guy, you know. I mean, the plays that he's making in the game is crazy to the outside world, but he does this on a daily. So, you know, it's, it's beautiful to see. Yeah, it's such a fun story uh, that you have. And when you've been in the league as long as you have and you don't start the year right on a roster, people start to wonder – you know, is this the end of the road? 
to wind back up in, in Kansas City and to get that opportunity again, how do you kind of just reflect? Because you could easily play it the other way. If that didn't happen, you know, we're not talking about you today. We're not talking to you today. And who knows if you would have got another opportunity. Exactly, man. That's why, you know, you got to keep your faith and you got to keep your work ethic, man. I mean, uh, I, I, through those times, you know, when it got to week eight, me and my team talked about it. If it got, you know, week 10 or 11, we were going to, you know, review our options, but um, kept working, looked for a sign. And, you know, thankfully, I was putting an opportunity to be back with the Chiefs where I know I was going to be able to be used in whatever capacity that they were going to have me. I was just glad to be around the guys and glad to, to be playing and, you know, just to sit there and know that, you know, you can still do what you've done in your career at a level that you can do it at, then there's nothing better. Relive the moment for me. So you guys make the stop on defense. Mahomes getting the ball back. Everyone in America knows he's putting the ball in the end zone. But when he finally finds McCall Hardman and it's right in that moment, you guys are rushing off that sideline. How do you kind of relive that knowing you're world champs again? Man, it's just, you know, it's a feeling you can't describe, man. It's, it's just accumulation of all the work and how many weeks it takes and the guys and the injuries and the adversity and the doubt, the media and everything. And just everybody, everybody's just so close in our locker room to where, you know, we all speak up on each other. We all motivate each other. And we're all, you know, like a brotherhood in there. So you're really playing and winning with family. I mean, I know you see Coach Reed and how he interacts with the guys. It's, it's, it's more unique than any other coach in the NFL. So he really treats us, you know, like a, it's almost like we're a bunch of big guys and older dudes that's on a peewee team now. We're playing for orange slices at halftime. It's, just, it's too much fun, man. It's just. And then we're sitting here with greatness. I mean, in, in my humble opinion, I, I played with three first ballot Hall of Famers. Pat Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Chris Jones. I mean, and to be able to have the opportunity to breathe that same air, be on the field and make history with those guys, I mean, you can't beat it. And the post-game party looked uh, pretty damn good in Vegas after the game. I know there's always going to be cameras there, but when Taylor Swift is uh, rocking through with, uh, rolling through with Travis, we're going to see all the content. We, some years we don't see the content of the post-game party, but that looked like it was a good time. Oh yeah, it was a good time, man. I mean, there's there's too many cameras going around nowadays, man. I, I miss I miss the good old days where this was just rumors, you know what I'm saying? But it was a good time. Everybody had fun, you know. So it was good. Have you become a big Taylor Swift fan during this football season? I tell us what's cool, man. You know, Trav's my boy, makes Trav happy. So if that if that's what it is, that may, that works for me. I have to bring up the the parade as Mike Pinnell uh, joins us right now. You know, Absolutely. it go it goes from a moment of euphoria. You see. Uh, I was talking to Spags yesterday, right? Willie Gay was like in the streets with a bottle of Henny with the shoes off. Travis Kelsey's drunk as a skunk, uh, you know, singing a singing a song. And then instantly it changes to a moment of a tragedy. Just how did you kind of process the unfortunate events at the parade the other day? Um, to be honest, I'm still processing it. Um, and I'd like to take this moment to, um, you know, give a shout out to all the families that were affected Um the Kansas City Chiefs, the NFL, and United Way are partnering together for a foundation. So if you guys want to donate and support anything, no matter how small or how big, please go to chfs.me slash KC Strong. And that is chfs.me at KC Strong. Um, it, it was just a real moment, man. Um, you're at the highest of your high, and then you're you're rushing to the back and making sure that, you know, everybody's kids and families are – staying below or away from the windows and you're sitting on the bus and you're hearing all types of different information what's going on but when you hear the final information what's going on it's a very sad time in, in america you know for something like that to be going on and i know in america there's a lot of that and um i'm just hoping that you know through understanding and you know we, we just got to be better we just got to be better I, I i don't i don't even know the answer at this point but um that, that's that's for those children's lives to be affected like that and for that woman's life to be taken, um, it, it makes it a very dark spot on that day. Uh, no doubt about it. I uh, really appreciate you saying what you said and also giving out the link as well. He's Mike Pinnell, Kansas City Chiefs, two-time Super Bowl champion. Uh, before we let you run, you know, I'm sure you want to get back to Kansas City, right? I'm sure that you want to play for this team once again next year. Now it feels like uh, you guys are going for that three-peat. And if you guys get that three-peat, man, uh, that would really be something. Um, that would be definitely be something I want to be a part of, you know, uh, Casey is family. Um, but, you know, being in the NFL a long time, we understand everything's a business. But to be a part of that, like you said, that would be that would be legendary. And uh, you get to a certain point in your career where you want to be a part of history. You want to be able to play for, you know, something and you want to be able to 
you know, be motivated to to play in these games late in Feb or mid February and late in January. So I, I, I would love that personally. I have to have some fun with you here because I know you used to play for okay. the Jets. Uh, my producer, uh, Michael Samter, used to be a longtime Jets fan. And then this year mm -hmm. he said, I can't take the pain the Jets cause me anymore. I'm rooting for the Chiefs. Do you think, like, do you accept him into Chiefs kingdom? Is, is that okay? Or is it like, hey, you got to pay your dues a little bit? It's tough, but we have to accept it. As a Jets <laughs> fan, I understand he has been through a lot of trauma. You know, I played there. There's a lot of switching around. So, you know, uh, we accept him with open arms. Come on. Come on. But you only get one. You only get one time. You can't. You can't. You can't skip more than two teams. If you're coming with us, it gotta be lifelong. We need a tattoo or something. Yeah. Oh, a tattoo. Well, Mike, would you, would you be yeah. down? You know, hold on, Mike Samter. Mike yeah. Pinnell basically says you could be an actual Chiefs fan if you get a tattoo. You know, let's get a Mike Pinnell tattoo on you. You're down for that. Uh, I, I don't do tattoos, but I would get a temporary tattoo of Mike, 100%. You know what? I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll, I'll even go lower back if you want it. No, I, I think we got to get then, a temporary oh, face tattoo. Why not? Let's do it. No, he already said it. We're, we're, on, we're, on, we're live. Let's do it. Tramp stamp. Let's do it. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, Mike, once again, uh, we're elated for you. You had a heck of a Super Bowl. Uh, thanks so much for uh, jumping on board and enjoy this. All right? Perfect. Thank you so much for having me.